You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What's something you learned in history class that you feel like wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Headquarters of the Army of the Potomac. General Order Number 66. June 28, 1863. By direction of the President of the United States, I hereby assume the command of the Army of the Potomac. As a soldier, in obeying this order, an order totally unexpected and unsolicited, I have no promises or pledges to make. The country looks to this army to relieve it from the devastation and disgrace of a hostile invasion. Whatever fatigues and sacrifices we may be called upon to undergo, let us have in view constantly the magnitude of the interests involved, and let each man determine to do his duty, leaving to an all-controlling providence the decision of the contest. It is with just diffidence that I relieve in the command of this army an eminent and accomplished soldier whose name must ever appear conspicuous in the history of its achievements but I rely upon the hearty support of my companions in arms to assist me in the discharge of the duties of the important trust which has been confided to me. George G. Meade, Major General, Commanding. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 313 of our Civil War podcast. My name is Rich. And regrettably, Tracy will not be joining us this week due to the unfortunate fact she has a nasty sore throat slash cold that has laid her low the last couple of days. So although she will be with us in spirit, her physical body is over yonder in the next room where any coughing, should it occur, will not disturb the onward march of the podcast toward Gettysburg. All right, so let's get to it, shall we? As you guys will recall, when last we left the Army of the Potomac, Joe Hooker was holding it below its namesake river in northern Virginia, facing west, where it was in position to protect Washington while Hooker tried to figure out just what Robert E. Lee was up to out beyond the Blue Ridge. Fighting Joe was slow to understand the meaning of the Confederates' movements, and even as the main strength of the rebel army streamed into Maryland and Pennsylvania, the Federal commander dithered indecisively with one scheme and then another. However, on June 23rd and 24th, the alarm bells rang loudly enough for even Hooker to hear, and he realized he needed to get the Army of the Potomac moving. By that time, though, Lee had a two-day head start, and the long-suffering Union infantry were once again called on to do some hard marching in order to make up for Hooker's being slow on the draw. The Yankee soldiers later remembered the next few days marching as the worst of the campaign, with many units covering more than 20 miles on June 25th. A soldier in the 44th New York, part of the 5th Corps, noticed a pattern to the days of hard marching. The men rose to the sound of the drums about 3 a.m. each morning, brewed and drank their coffee, and gathered up their gear. By 4 a.m. they took to the road, 
and the rest of the day fell into a predictable rhythm. Two miles of marching, then a 15-minute rest. Lather, rinse, repeat. And by 5 p.m., they had usually covered their 20 miles. To lead the northward, northward march, screening the rest of the army against any possible eastward lunge by Lee, Hooker detailed three of his seven corps, the 1st, 3rd, and 11th, all under the command of the 1st Corps' Major General John Reynolds. Reynolds was a native of Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, had commanded the 1st Corps since September 1862, and was one of the most admired and respected generals in the Army of the Potomac. By June 27th, Hooker had the entire army on the north bank of the Potomac and his own headquarters at Frederick, Maryland. However, he still seemed to have little idea of what to actually do about Robert E. Lee. Brigadier General Marcena Patrick, the Army's Provo Marshal, remarked that Hooker, quote, acts like a man without a plan and is entirely at a loss what to do or how to match the enemy or counteract his movements. Whatever he does is the result of impulse now after having failed so signally at Chancellorsville. His role now is waiting for something to turn up. He knows that Lee is his master and is afraid to meet him in battle. Well, Marcena Patrick wasn't the only one to notice Hooker's continued reluctance to meet Lee in battle again after the Confederate commander had humiliated him at Chancellorsville. Since the beginning of the still-unfolding present campaign, Fighting Joe had exhibited a noticeable desire to avoid a head-on collision with Lee, and instead counter whatever Lee was doing by some spectacular achievement of his own, like the capture of Richmond. Now, Hooker concocted a questionable scheme for pulling the garrison out of Harper's Ferry uniting it with Slocum's 12th Corps and sending this force off to cut the supply line that Hooker thought Lee must have somewhere. The plan would have been far-fetched even if Lee had actually possessed the supply line Hooker imagined. But in any case, Hooker's idea had one sovereign virtue. It might derail Lee's invasion of Pennsylvania without the need for Hooker to meet him in battle. The problem was that the Harper's Ferry garrison was part of a separate department, one that Hooker didn't command, and so getting those troops meant Fighting Joe would have to seek the permission of General-in-Chief Henry Halleck. We've pointed out previously on the podcast that there was bad blood between Halleck and Hooker going back to pre-war days in California so much so that when Hooker took command of the Army of the Potomac, he got Abraham Lincoln to agree to a rather unorthodox arrangement where Hooker could bypass the normal chain of command, that is, basically, ignore Halleck, and report directly to Lincoln. As we said, Lincoln should never have agreed to this arrangement, and back at the beginning of this present campaign, when the Confederate Army was on the move, and Hooker was cooking up harebrained schemes like marching on Richmond instead of fighting Lee, well, Lincoln decided it was time to put Hooker back in his proper relationship with Halleck, which Lincoln proceeded to do. But naturally, Hooker hadn't been at all happy about that. And now, that was all coming to a head, as Harper's Ferry turned into a battle of wills between Fighting Joe and Old Brains. The battle of wills between Hooker and Halleck over what to do with the 10,000 men at Harper's Ferry escalated quickly, and on the afternoon of June 27th, a telegraph exchange between them culminated with Hooker declaring that, as matters now stood, he could not fulfill his assigned mission, quote, an earnestly request that I may at once be relieved from the position I occupy. In other words, Hooker had decided to go all in 
If the troops at Harper's Ferry weren't released to him, he wanted to be relieved as commander of the Army of the Potomac. This play was a gamble on Hooker's part, but one that he almost certainly considered a reasonable one. After all, in the midst of a major military crisis, with the rebel army marching through Pennsylvania, Hooker surely thought there was little chance Abraham Lincoln would dare permit a change of commanders in the army. Surely the president would have to make Halleck back down, right? At 8 p.m. on June 27th, Halleck replied to Hooker's message by saying, quote, your application to be relieved from your present command is received. As you were appointed to this command by the president, I have no power to relieve you. Your dispatch has been duly referred for executive action. End quote. Well, for his part, Abraham Lincoln appears to have consulted with no one except Halleck with regard to Hooker's request to be relieved, and the president hesitated not at all in accepting Fighting Joe's resignation. After a cabinet meeting the next day, Navy Secretary Gideon Wells recorded Lincoln's brief comments on the subject, saying the president indicated that, with a new battle imminent, he had witnessed the same failings in Hooker that he'd observed previously in McClellan, and that when Halleck had opposed abandoning Harper's Ferry, Hooker, quote, had thought it best to give up the command. According to Wells, Lincoln didn't mention Hooker's lack of support among his subordinates, but this almost certainly was a major factor in the president's decision. As you guys will recall, back in episode number 301, we talked about how, after the debacle at Chancellorsville, a great deal of trouble lay at the very top of the Army of the Potomac and how the other generals' lack of confidence in Hooker was a matter of grave concern to Abraham Lincoln. After Chancellorsville, Hooker had virtually no support among his chief lieutenants, most of whom, in conversations with the president, had already announced their preference for their own candidate, George Meade. Almost certainly, This knowledge of the troubling lack of support among Hooker's top subordinates laid the groundwork for Lincoln's willingness to accept Fighting Joe's resignation. Coming when it did, Hooker's resignation both embarrassed and relieved the president. It was embarrassing because yet another change of command in the midst of an ongoing campaign would not reflect well on the Lincoln administration. But, on the other hand, Hooker's resignation was a relief to the president, because although it came at a critical moment, Lincoln, Halleck, and Secretary of War Edwin Stanton had been steadily losing confidence in Hooker's ability to successfully confront Robert E. Lee in another major battle. What little confidence Lincoln still had in Hooker was shattered when the general asked to be relieved at a moment of crisis for the Union, with Lee's invasion of Pennsylvania in full swing. And so Abraham Lincoln seems to have hesitated not at all in accepting Hooker's resignation. The president also didn't hesitate when it came to naming Fighting Joe's replacement. It would be 5th Corps Commander George Gordon Meade. The Army of the Potomac's other high-ranking officers had left no doubt Meade was their choice for the top spot, and besides, the other generals who had been in consideration for command of the Army had already turned it down. So that evening, the evening of June 27th, General Orders No. 194 was drawn up, relieving Joe Hooker as commander of the Army of the Potomac and appointing George Meade as his replacement. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? 
Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation, Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast, where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast, wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. History never says goodbye. It just says, see you later. Edward Galliano was right when he said that. Events keep happening over and over again in some form. And that's the reason I produce the podcast, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. What is it? We take stories of history and apply them to the events of today to help you perhaps understand them better. We are also part of Airwave Media Network. I've been doing the program since 2006. That's a long time, and the show has a long name. My history can beat up your politics. Find me wherever you get podcasts. George Mead was born in Spain on December 31st, 1815. His father, Richard, was a businessman from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but had moved to Spain in 1806 to better manage his family's business interests in that country. Richard also served as the United States naval agent in Spain during the Napoleonic Wars and prospered as a merchant, but also acquired enormous debt. The struggle that was involved in trying to receive compensation for the debt he had assumed during those years consumed Richard Meade for the next decade. But first, the Spanish authorities, and then the U.S. government, denied his claim. His fruitless, frustrating, exhausting quest for compensation led Richard to an early grave and left his family in precarious financial circumstances. His widow, Margaret, struggled to raise 11 children. Young George attended several schools and excelled in his studies, but with limited funds to continue his education, his mother had him apply to the U.S. Military Academy at West Point in 1830 at the age of 14. He received an appointment the next year to enter with the class of 1835. Meade didn't distinguish himself at West Point. Homesick, lonely, and suffering through several bouts with illness, he settled into the top third of his class in most of his subjects and stayed there for his entire four years. A career in the military held little appeal for Meade, and after his first two years at West Point, he seems to have settled upon the idea of only staying in the Army after graduation to do his required one year of service before resigning for quote-unquote civil pursuits. When Meade graduated in 1835, he ranked 19th in a class of 56. He lacked the grades to be assigned to the elite Corps of Engineers and received an an assignment to the artillery instead. After putting in his requisite year of service at a posting in Massachusetts and chasing Seminoles in Florida, Meade acted on his desire to enter into civil pursuits and resigned from the Army in 1836 as a second lieutenant. Over the next six years, he held a variety of jobs, usually as a surveyor of railroads or boundaries. The pay was good, but no contract was permanent. During this time, he met and married Margaret Sargent, daughter of a prominent Philadelphia Philadelphia lawyer and Whig politician, 
They were married on December 31st, 1840, on George's 25th birthday. In 1841, the Meads celebrated the birth of their first child, John. Mead decided to rejoin the Army in 1842, obtaining an appointment to the Corps of Topographical Engineers as a second lieutenant. For the next three years, he supervised the construction of lighthouses on Delaware Bay. In August 1845, Meade received orders to report to General Zachary Taylor in Texas. During his service in the Mexican War, Meade served Taylor as a courier and then as a lead scout, guiding attacking columns forward under fire several times. He received a brevet promotion and was appointed to serve on Winfield Scott's staff, but his time with Scott was brief, as there was a surplus of engineers on the general's staff, and Meade was ordered back to Washington in March 1847. Meade's war service solidified his development as a military professional. He felt he'd answered the soldier's basic question, Can I perform capably under fire? And his brevet promotion was proof that he'd done his duty well. After his service in Mexico, the next nine years saw Meade survey for, or supervise, the construction of lighthouses in Delaware, New Jersey, and Florida. Promotion came steadily during this period, to first lieutenant in 1851 and to captain in 1856. During those same years, four more children were born to George and Margaret. Later in 1856, Meade received a new assignment, assistant to the officer in charge of the survey of the Great Lakes. This survey was a long-running project, begun in 1841 and not concluded until 1881. Meade became head of the operation in 1857, and four years later the outbreak of the Civil War found him, found him in Detroit, Michigan, where he had moved his family to join him. After the firing on Fort Sumter in the spring of 1861, with the outbreak of hostilities, Michigan Governor Austin Blair offered Meade a colonelcy in one of the state's volunteer regiments, but Meade didn't immediately accept the office offer. He was holding out for a higher appointment, and in August he found out he'd been appointed a Brigadier General of Volunteers and assigned to command the 2nd Brigade in the newly raised Division of Pennsylvania Reserves. This division was comprised of volunteer regiments that Pennsylvania raised above and beyond the War Department quota for the state. The 1st Brigade in the division would be commanded by Meade's fellow Pennsylvanian, John Reynolds. As part of Fitzjohn Porter's 5th Corps, the reserves saw action during the Seven Days Battles outside Richmond in the summer of 1862 during McClellan's Peninsula Campaign. At Glendale, Meade was hit by two bullets, one in the left arm, the other in his side. Recuperating back home in Philadelphia, Meade quickly mended under the care of the family physician and returned to duty in time to participate in the Battle of Second Bull Run at the end of August. John Reynolds was now in command of the division, and Meade took over Reynolds' old brigade. The Pennsylvania Reserves were in the thick of the action at Second Bull Run, playing a critical role in stopping the last Confederate push on August 30th, the climactic day of the battle. Immediately after the battle, Lee launched the campaign that saw him invade Maryland and led to the brutal slugfest at Antietam. With Reynolds ordered to Harrisburg to train volunteers being raised to meet the emergency, Meade was given command of the division, which was now part of Hooker's 1st Corps. After enjoying notable success at the Battle of South Mountain, the reserves took part in the pursuit of Lee's army to Sharpsburg, Maryland. There, on the evening of September 16th, Meade's division skirmished with John Bell Hood's Confederate division for control of the East Woods. The fighting resumed the next morning, and on September 17th, the reserves and the 1st Corps 
engaged in some of the heaviest fighting of the entire war. When Hooker was wounded, he turned over command of the Corps to Meade. The promotion was short-lived, though. When Reynolds returned to the Army, he was given command of the First Corps, while Hooker recuperated. Meade returned to division command. On December 6th, he received the news that he'd been promoted to Major General. At Fredericksburg on December 13th, Meade's Pennsylvania Reserves broke into the Confederate position on the southern portion of the battlefield, achieving the only Federal success of the day, but had to retreat when reinforcements failed to support the breakthrough. Fredericksburg was a disaster for the Army of the Potomac, but Meade's star rose, and on December 23rd, Burnside gave him command of the V Corps. Some four months later, with Hooker now in command of the Army of the Potomac, the Battle of Chancellorsville was a frustrating experience for Meade. The battle, for the Federals, culminated in the odd, midnight Council of War in which Meade was one of the generals who pushed for remaining on the far side of the Rappahannock and attacking the Confederates. But Hooker decided to call it quits and retreat back across the river. Later, Meade was furious when Hooker disingenuously claimed he, Meade, had actually advocated a withdrawal. While Meade refused to join Couch and others in openly conspiring for Hooker's removal, he nevertheless told his wife he was at quote-unquote open war with Hooker after he and Fighting Joe had a stormy meeting where Hooker confronted Meade over some things Meade had told Pennsylvania Governor Andrew Curtin when Curtin had visited the Army. At that meeting with Hooker, angry words were exchanged, although Meade pointed out the criticism that he had shared with Curtin was nothing that he hadn't already said to Hooker's face. It was this strained relationship that existed between the two men as Lee opened this new campaign, and then as the Army of the Potomac finally moved across its namesake river and marched into Maryland, trying to make up for lost time. On June 27th, the V Corps had marched about 16 miles before reaching its destination for the day, Frederick, Maryland. His was the first corps to arrive outside Frederick, so after making arrangements for the encampment of his men, Meade and a couple of staff officers rode into town to find Hooker, whom he hadn't seen since leaving the Rappahannock on June 13th. Meade knew little of the overall current situation and was hoping for a briefing at Army headquarters. Hooker, Hooker, however, had went to Harper's Ferry for the day as part of his futile quest to gain control of the troops there, and since there was no telling when he would return, Meade returned to 5th Corps headquarters. When he turned in that night, Meade was just another Corps commander, waiting for instructions regarding tomorrow's march. But just a few hours later, at 3 o'clock in the morning of June 28th, he was awakened by an unexpected visitor who was bearing orders from Washington, orders that would make George Gordon Meade the new commander of the Army of the Potomac. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad locomotive steamed through the night on a special mission to Frederick, Maryland. Its crowded cab held an engineer, a fireman, and a Union Army officer, Colonel James Hardy, the colonel carried an order that would change the fate of the Army of the Potomac, firing Joe Hooker and replacing him with George Meade. Neither general had any idea that Hardy was on his way to them. Earlier that evening, the evening of June 27th, Abraham Lincoln, Edwin Stanton, and Henry Halleck had met in Stanton's office to draft the order concerning Hooker's removal and Meade's appointment. With Hooker's fate sealed, Hardy was called into the office 
where his boss, the Secretary of War, explained the special mission they were entrusting to him. He must find Meade, explain the situation to him, then take Meade to Hooker's headquarters, where the transfer of command would be accomplished. Hardy, ba Hardy balked at first. He knew both generals well, and under military etiquette, the right and proper thing to do would be to see Hooker first, then go to Meade. However, that wasn't the way Lincoln, Halleck, or Stanton wanted it done, and the president said he would take responsibility for any hard feelings that arose between the generals. The War Department had already ordered a special train to carry the messenger to his destination. A packet of orders and passes was, handled to, was handed to Hardy, along with more than sufficient money to buy his way out of any trouble that might confront him on his journey, which was a very real possibility since Jeb Stuart's Confederate cavalry was rampaging through the region. The colonel left Stanton's office late that evening and made his way to the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Station, just a couple of blocks from the Capitol building. His special train turned out to be a lone steam locomotive, and Hardy likely had to stand on the footplate, sharing the small cab with the engineer and fireman. Sometime after midnight, the engine rolled into the small depot at South and Market Streets in Frederick. The colonel detrained and immediately ran into hordes of carousing Union soldiers who filled the streets of the town. After a long search, he finally found a buggy for hire. He climbed aboard, and he and the driver set out to find Meade's camp. Just before 3 a.m. on the morning of June 28th, Hardy's conveyance pulled up at 5th Corps headquarters. Guards challenged him, but waving his passes, he made his way to Meade's tent. Meade was awakened by the commotion and began to rise from his cot as Hardy entered. The colonel said, I've come to give you trouble. Meade, his mind still fogged by sleep and astonished by the sudden appearance of a visitor from Washington, at first thought Hardy had come to arrest him or relieve him from command. The general's reply, My conscience is clear, probably puzzled Hardy, but he handed Meade two documents, saying, Please read these. Meade pulled on his glasses and by candlelight read, General Order Number 194, War Department, June 27, 1863. By direction of the President, Major General Joseph Hooker is relieved of command of the Army of the Potomac, and Major General George G. Meade is appointed to command of that army. By order of the Secretary of War. Meade then turned to the second paper, which was a letter of instruction from Halleck. It reminded me that the Army of the Potomac was both a protective shield for Washington and the force on the field that was expected to bring the ar enemy army to battle. It closed with the assurance to Meade that, quote, You are entrusted with all the power and authority which the President, the Secretary of War, or the General-in-Chief can confer on you, and you may rely on our full support. At first, Meade protested, saying that John Reynolds should be given the job, and the entire army thought so. But Meade didn't know that Reynolds had already taken himself out of the running. Meade then asked Hardy to wire the Secretary of War, with a request that Meade be relieved from having to obey this order. However, the colonel very firmly explained that there was no appealing this decision. Hooker was out and Meade was in. Finally, Meade made clear to his visitor that he was deeply troubled by the way in which this affair was being handled. In the matter of a change of command, protocol dictated that Hooker should have been the first officer to be informed of his relief. Hooker then would have sent for Meade to tell him face to face that he was being promoted to commanding general of the army. But Hardy told Meade that while he too was unhappy about how this business was being conducted, 
This was exactly the way Washington wanted it. Having run out of objections, Meade replied, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, I've been tried and condemned without a hearing, and I suppose I shall have to go to the execution. The colonel impressed upon Meade the need to proceed to Hooker's headquarters at once to effect the transfer of command. Meade dressed quickly, putting on his dusty marching uniform. He exited his tent, ordered his horse, Old Baldy, saddled, and directed that one of his aides ride with him. That young officer was his son, Captain George Meade, Jr. The sky was just beginning to lighten as the trio rode the three miles to Hooker's headquarters. Meade was mostly silent during the ride although he occasionally asked a question of Hardy. As soon as Fighting Joe saw his visitors, he knew why they had come. The previous afternoon, he had sent that telegram to Washington, offering his resignation, and now he found out that his gamble had failed. Lincoln had, indeed, dared to accept his resignation, and in the middle of an ongoing campaign, At a moment of crisis, the president was putting a new general in command of the Army of the Potomac. The business of transferring command was begun at once. Meade and Hardy were ushered inside. It wasn't long before Hooker's chief of staff, Major General Daniel Butterfield, was called into the tent, where the four men discussed the overall situation facing the Army. Hooker said Lee's exact whereabouts were still unknown, though by this time reports confirmed the Confederates had marched up the Cumberland Valley through southern Pennsylvania and were approaching the Susquehanna River. Meade asked about the disposition of the Army of the Potomac's 7th Infantry Corps and the Cavalry Divisions. When he heard how they were spread all over the Maryland countryside, he became visibly agitated. Hooker then became defensive, and tensions in the tent ratcheted up. The conference lasted until mid-afternoon. When Meade left Hooker's tent, he summoned his son, who had been waiting patiently outside. Of that moment, young George wrote that he, quote, could not fail to observe that the general continued very grave, but also perceived a familiar twinkle of the eye denoting anticipation of surprise at information to be imparted, the effect of which I was curious to see. And so, when at last he quietly said, Well, George, I am in command of the Army of the Potomac. I was not, after all, very much surprised. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is Mead, The Price of Command, 1863 to 1865 by John G. Selby. Don't forget you can find all of our book recommendations at the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. And then as we wrap up this show, we want to thank the newest members of the Strawfoot Brigade for their support of the podcast. Cam, Paul, Mike, Scott, Dave W., JT, and C. Stephen. Michael, Robert, and David B. JT gets another shout out for his donation. And we also want to thank Daniel F. for his very generous donation this past week. Thank you, one and all. And thanks to everyone for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. Tracy and I do hope that you join us again next time, but until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.